So, where was I? Oh, yeah. Final Fantasy VIII sucks, and you suck for liking it. It's a poorly written, badly designed piece of shit with annoying as fuck characters, a pointless card collecting minigame, and the most needlessly complicated and micromanaged character management system ever devised for any game. It's full of ridiculous meta game concepts, boring level grinding activities, and tedious magic collection busy work. The, the plot makes no sense, the weapons are ridiculous, and the setting is strangely underpopulated and technologically wildly anachronistic. It's long, boring, it's stupid, and I hate it with the fiery intensity of a million foreman grills. But before I actually get started, here's my final word on drawing magic in response to literally thousands of emails explaining just how wrong I was. Back when I first started, I mentioned how the game requires you to spend hours in combat pulling magic out of the monsters so that you can beef up your character attributes. And when I first played this game as a kid, I had to do it for every single spell in the game. And everyone and their mother emailed me with alternative ways to get magic, and in fact, they mailed me several step-by-step -step procedures to maximize my efficiency at this task, which could have only come through years of study and the worldwide collaboration of Final Fantasy VIII players in grand academic symposia. Honestly, it's sad how intensely some of you guys have studied and mastered this piece of crap. I had people emailing me all the time, ostensibly just to brag about how many times they've beaten the game, and with progressively more and more ridiculous restrictions on their own gameplay like all melee attacks, no melee attacks, no limit breaks, no GFs, only GFs, only squall, and all that effort, all that time squandered, and you could have been doing anything, anything, like finding a game that doesn't blow ass! Well, you're entirely correct. You don't need to spend hours drawing every magic spell in the game to win. It's entirely possible, and in fact, preferable to refine items, cards, and magic spells using GF abilities to fill in your magic list. In fact, when I played through this game a second time, I did this quite a lot when I discovered you could refine 10 Kiragas out of a single tent, and junctioning that to my hit points basically quadrupled my score. Combine that with the GF ability to transform monsters into cards, and then refine the cards into magic, and you've got a pretty good system which keeps your level low and your magic stocked. That being said, I have a few things I'd like you to consider. First, this is ridiculous. I, I want you to think about this. This is a story where a group of people are bopping around the world, encountering monsters, and using some vaguely defined magic power taught to them by servant elementals, turning them into collectible playing cards in a game that everyone in the entire world plays. Now, where are they getting these cards? Uh, do they have the power to turn monsters into cards too? How is that possible? But not only that, these summon demons also have the power to turn common everyday items, as well as these playing cards, into mystical energy in the form of magic spells. You're telling me that I could go into a sporting goods store in this world, buy a tent, and tell the devil in my magic lamp to turn it into ten Kiraga spells? But do these spells take up tangible space? Are they in a book? Are they in my pocket? Why can I only carry a hundred of them? How does the character actually junction these spells to the hit points? Is it like a ring or a lotion or something? Where are your hit points located? I can also tell the devil to refine his own card into a hundred black holes, which I can then refine into the Demi spell, which is a great spell for junctioning to your attack stat. But what's a black hole? Do you actually mean to say that I'm carrying a hundred collapsed stars in my pants? And I got all that from a playing card? And even with that, you still need to draw a lot of magic, it's still busy work, it's still boring, and even though you found a slightly more convenient way to get magic outside of combat, aren't you really still substituting one kind of busy work for another? And I don't care how good the rare triple triad cards are, the items you get simply aren't worth the effort of playing hours of this pointless fucking card game. Got it? Drawing magic still sucks, the magic system is still overly complicated, needlessly metaphysical, and completely nonsensical in the way it's arranged. And you can stop emailing me about it, okay? Moving on! When we last left our heroes, the group tried to kidnap the president of Galbadia by staging a complicated train robbery, but despite all their careful planning, they didn't know the president has a zombie body double specifically made to foil this exact kind of thing. You know, the president having an undead body double would have made the movie Dave much more interesting. Hail to the chief, he's the one we all say hail to. Dave's a working class, ordinary guy with big dreams for America. I once caught a fish this big. So he decided to run for president. But Dave's just got one little problem. He's secretly a zombie. Is this legal? Oh, yeah. Probably. 
He's just dying to get in the Oval Office. Has this guy been having too many Happy Meals for lunch or what? Dave of the Dead. He may not have the brains you need to be president, but he's working on it. I'm gonna kill him. Can't kill a president. Dave of the Dead. Because you can't kill the president if he's already dead. Anyway, with the train kidnapping botched, the party returns to Timber to come up with a new plan. Apparently, the president's already in Timber and is headed to the local TV station to make some kind of national address. This shocks everyone since nobody's been able to broadcast in 17 years because of some kind of signal interference that's been blanketing the world. Why? I don't know. But uh, all communications in this world now take place through something called HD cables. The group guesses that's why Galbadia invaded and sent Biggs and Wedge to fix the transmission tower so they could use it in an attempt to broadcast even to places without cable. Well, if they don't have cable, they probably don't have fucking televisions either! And even if they do, they won't know when you're making this broadcast! Not unless you, like, drop TV guides out of a fucking airplane! And really, it took them 17 years to come up with this plan. Really, find and repair a gigantic fucking transmission tower. Uh, weren't they using those 17 years ago when the interference hit? If those had worked, they'd still be using them! I don't know, maybe the president knows something we don't, but I guess people are still holding out hope because someone's still maintaining the 60-foot-wide Jumbotron in timber, even after 17 years of radio silence, and it's on 24 hours a day displaying the same random interference. What, are people still watching it? They got nowhere else to put it? Why wouldn't they just turn it off? And why does it look like the TV is displaying code from the Matrix? And why in the hell is there still a fully functional TV broadcast station in town? Wishful thinking? Oh, and if radio communications are impossible, why is Biggs able to summon the mechanical spider with a wireless fucking remote? I hate this fucking game! Anyway, Renoa decides to attack the TV station to broadcast their own declaration of Timber's independence because... Uh, I guess she'll just send the armed commandos screaming in terror. Zone shows up to say that the president's in the station already preparing to make a speech, and because of that there's too many guards in there to handle. Abort! Abort! The guy we knew was going to be at the TV station is at the TV station with the guards we knew he would have! Did we have a plan? Well, I guess they were worrying over nothing because apparently the president's guards are easier to beat than the Detroit Lions because Cypher faces literally no resistance as he charges directly into the studio and holds the president hostage. And somehow, don't ask me how, Quistis is right on his ass. She turns around and starts screaming into the camera for backup. And when you get there, she explains that Cypher broke out of the disciplinary room and went rogue. Well, this just proves Cypher's gay because trust me, any straight guy stuck in a place called the disciplinary room with Quistis... He wouldn't want to leave. Everyone starts trying to talk Cypher down, but things start to escalate when Zell just calls Cypher an idiot. Cypher fires back by calling Zell a chicken wuss. And honestly, even though I give Cypher a lot of shit, I don't know why they're trying to browbeat him so hard. He just accomplished what we've been trying to do all fucking day. Kidnap the president. I say let's steal a car, throw his fat ass in the trunk, and get the fuck out of here. Give Cypher a medal. Zell, the tit, lets it slip they all come from one of the gardens, and he does this with the broadcast cameras rolling, no less, so it basically ensures a global shitstorm about to descend on the gardens. Now, at first it seems like Zell is officially the dumbest jackass on the planet, but it's not like it's impossible to figure out these guys are seeds. After all, their faces are being broadcast to literally every TV on the planet, and both Cypher and Squall are using gunblades, which we know to be the trademark weapon of Seed Special Forces. And besides that, how many international mercenary armies really exist on this planet anyway? Cypher backs up directly into a shadowy masked woman known as the Sorceress, and she appears from a magic portal. She starts to taunt him by calling him a boy and mocking his inexperience and immaturity. The boy in you is telling you to come. Yeah, it is. But the adult in you is telling you to back off. Don't be ashamed to ask for help. Besides, you're only a little boy. Stop calling me a boy! You don't want to be a boy anymore? I am not a boy! I am a man! And get this, that's all it takes for Cypher to give up his whole life in service to some evil mastermind. Honestly, is Cypher the most easily manipulated little worm on the planet or what? In essence, all she did was insinuate he had a small dick. No, really. It's just about one step up from going... <laughs> Seriously, are we supposed to buy this? Who's going to believe that a hero, young and reckless though he may be, is simply going to abandon his entire life and his career in a prestigious, respected order of warrior knights just because some evil wizard challenges his feelings of powerlessness and impotence and offers him the chance at power and respect he feels he's been denied? You're not all-powerful. Well, I should be. 
I will be the most powerful Jedi ever. Anyway, the sorceress vanishes, dragging Cypher along by his balls through the magic portal when... Whoa, wait, did you see that? Hey, the sorceress vanished and Renoa just ran into the scene. She just pulled a Clark Kent! Watching it. Okay, so after failing again, the group tries to, uh, regroup. Renoa says the Forest Owl's base has been destroyed. How does she know that? So they... What the hell is Renoa doing in this alley? Should I be watching this? Ugh. Okay, the group holds up in some lady's house where they decide to... And what is Zell doing? Man, there's an awful lot of squatting going on in this game. Honest to God, Zell, can't you go ten minutes without jerking off in the corner of some stranger's house? For some reason, Squall and the others chalk Cypher up as a dead man, even though they all just witnessed him being recruited as a sorceress's cabana boy. Renault is still hopeful Cypher's okay, although I have no idea why. The guy is a complete toad. And Squall just starts whining his usual emo bullshit about how if you never expect anything good, you'll never be disappointed. To which Renoa shrieks that Squall is a meanie and storms out. Meanie? What are you, six? She's leading a guerrilla anti-government resistance movement, and she's still calling dudes meanies? I mean, honestly, the fate of the entire world is resting on these people. And if you think she's bad, I haven't even mentioned the wide-awake kawaii nightmare that is selfie. Love and peace! I'm just saying, she's one high school heartbreak away from becoming this. <laughs> So after that debacle, everyone figures it's a good idea to go back home and lay low until the heat's off. But there aren't any trains going back there, but luckily there's another garden nearby just over the river and through some woods. It makes me wonder why, though, if there's another garden so much closer to timber, why the forest owls just didn't hire soldiers from there? Especially since the game has already established that long-range communications are impossible. Even halfway through the trip, Zell is still shitting bricks that because of him, Galbadi is going to attack his home garden. Honestly, dude, even if they do, I really wouldn't worry too much about it because so far, they've been repeatedly foiled by a group of high school girls. Their argument is interrupted when once again the three of them are pulled into a dream world where Laguna and the gang are trying to infiltrate what looks like Superman's Fortress of Solitude. I think this is supposed to be the past, but I have no idea why the characters all have the same inventory, use the same GFs, and have the same magic and abilities junctioned as my old characters. D did none of these characters think this is at all unusual? Oh, uh, hey Laguna, how long have I been able to summon the elemental god of thunder and lightning? Now, I should explain something at this point. I had one of my GFs learn an ability that allows me to pull magic out of hidden spots on the map, so most of the time I'm playing the game, I'm actually hammering the X button to find them. And it's during one of these times that Laguna seems to find an old key that's invisible on the screen, but immediately after you get it, Laguna claims to feel a draft on his butt, and he loses the key through a hole in his pants. It's nowhere to be found on the screen because apparently after dropping it, Laguna kicks it 300 yards down the hall, around a corner, and up a flight of stairs. If you keep scouring every square inch of the base, you can actually find the key again, but this time when you pick it up, Laguna sneezes and loses it again! What the... how the... what in the hell was the point of that? What is wrong with you? D do you ever get to keep the key? What is it open? Why is it there? What am I doing here? Why? I don't even remember this from the first time around. This is something new I found. I seriously think this game is just fucking with me now, finding fresh new torments for my soul! The monsters in the Fortress of Solitude are just weird. Not only are there human and cyborg guards, but there's also some kind of flying tentacle beast that holds you down and teabags you, as well as some kind of weird alien who very nicely cast a cure spell on me before I panicked and shoved a harpoon up its ass. I don't really know what I'm doing here, but eventually Laguna finds himself backed up on the edge of a cliff and attacked by cyborg soldiers. No matter what you do, the last one you kill invokes some kind of power called Soul Crush and takes everyone down to one hit point. Your trusty sidekicks collapse because of their injuries, and Ward seems to be unable to speak because of a wound to his throat, although I suspect he wants his last words to be, Fuck you, Laguna! In an attempt to get him moving again, Laguna climbs on top of Ward and, I'm not kidding, starts to tickle him. He tickles him. When treating a friend who has a mortal throat injury, what should you do in that circumstance? A. Apply pressure to the wound and remind the patient not to panic. B. Elevate the afflicted area and hope the bleeding will die down with proper bandaging. Or C. Tickle him! Why don't you just give him a pink belly while you're at it, you fucking dolt? And, and hey, here's an idea. What about casting, um, I don't know, a cure spell? Or a healing potion? Or any one of the other hundreds of curative items I just spent hours collecting? Come on! 
Well, surprisingly, tickling the dying man doesn't help much. In desperation, Laguna notices some boats moored in the harbor below, but when he tells the others about them, Kiros just says, It's normally called a vessel. No, smartass, those are boats. Shut up. And just in case Laguna hasn't caused enough crippling injury to his buddies already, he decides the best thing to do is to hurl his critically injured companions off the cliff into the jagged rocks and water hundreds of feet below. Man, I bet when Ward hits the water, it's going to be like the asteroid hitting in deep impact. After that, the group wakes up, more annoyed than interested about their shared hallucinations, and resumes their trick to the... Ugh! Hey, they've only got one... You son of a bitch! The Soul Crush carried over to my normal characters? That's bullshit! Why didn't any of them mention they were at one goddamn hit point? That's just cheap! <sighs> Alright. After all that, the group finally makes it to Galvadia Garden, where they're given a new assignment. Terminate the Sorceress with extreme prejudice. It seems the president of Galbadia has appointed the Sorceress as an ambassador of peace, but nobody really buys that since she's the epitome of all that's evil, and it's clear that all they want to do is take over the world. Of course! Hiring the Sorceress as your ambassador of peace makes about as much sense as appointing the Green Goblin as the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Wait. This time they're going the more elegant and simple route of shooting her in the face with a high caliber rifle from half a mile away. And to accomplish this task, they're assigned a professional sharpshooter named Irvin. Well, at least he keeps a low profile. He's so inconspicuously dressed. Nobody would ever be suspicious of the guy dressed like an Old West gunslinger carrying a high-bore rifle. Is there some kind of special store where these guys go to to find the worst, most uncomfortable outfits in the world? Is there a walking cliché warehouse, or do you have to get a mail-order catalog? Uh, yes, um, I'd like the Briscoe County package. Um, that's made with a 100% stereotype, right? And just in case you were in danger of accidentally liking one of these characters, Irvin's a complete cock who hits on anything with a pair of tits, and he does it with all the grace of a drunken asshole at a wet t-shirt contest. The ladies have none of it, and seriously, when the other men in the group consist of a whining, brooding emo pissant named Squall, and a hyperactive half-monkey named Zell, and the ladies think you're the creep, seek help. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. First I had to find the train to Dulling City. Maybe I wasn't paying attention, but I didn't actually know where the train station was, so I spent like an hour running around looking for some place to- ah! Wait, what in the... Uh. Well, it turns out the train is literally 10 feet to the northwest of the garden. It's just the camera controls are so bad I wasn't able to see it until I was right on top of it. And naturally, I have to pay 3,000 bucks for train tickets out of my own pocket, which still galls me even though I shouldn't really care. See, by now, thanks to the internet, I've downloaded a cheat sheet of all the seed exams and raised myself to seed level 20, so now I can just make $15,000 by running around in circles for a few minutes. I guess seeds get paid by the hour. So, I'm on the train, but it's not moving. I can't open the door, and I've already talked to everyone. If I try to go further, Squall just says, I can't go on before selfie. So what do I do? Well, get this. You have to try and leave the train the same way you come in, and you bump into selfie coming inside, and then you can go. Well, <laughs> obviously, right? When the train finally arrives in Delling City, Renoa tells you that you can meet your contact by taking bus number 8. Which is really easy, because every bus in the city is bus number 8! Once you arrive, the guy's doorman stops you and refuses to let you in until you can pass a test of bravery first by going to some ancient tomb. A test of bravery? Seriously, dude? Fuck you. How about this for a test of bravery? How about I summon the fucking devil to peel your face off and fuck you in the eye socket because I kicked his ass and he's my bitch now. At least you could have told me about this before I spent 3,000 bucks on fucking train tickets all the way out here. So you run over to the tomb of the Lost King only to see a couple of... What are they, schoolgirls? And they run outside yelling, FLOAT! That's a clue about how to beat the bosses inside, and it's not exactly hard to figure out, but even so, why would anyone run screaming out of a cave just saying, FLOAT! You know, if you were being attacked by minotaurs inside a cave, and you actually saw some people running forward to help you, wouldn't you instead shout, THERE APPEAR TO BE SOME MINOTAURS INSIDE THE CAVE AND YOU SHOULD CAST THE FLOAT SPELL TO PROTECT YOURSELVES! Ah! 
Inside you'll find a maze, and you're shown a map, but really, don't bother. Just keep turning right until you reach the end. And at the end, you'll meet a Minotaur who's pretty much a pushover, which is a good thing because he's got the Protect Shell and Life spells. So if you'll excuse me, I need to spend the next 20 minutes drawing 100 of those for everybody. And after you slap him around a little bit, he retreats to get his smaller big brother, and then they attack you as a team. And they've got a pretty stiff Wonder Twin attack, but they can't hurt you as long as you're floating, and they can't regenerate as long as you're floating them. It's pretty easy stuff, and they join you once you beat them. Inside the actual tomb is a jiggling suit of ghostly armor that gives you a playing card. Gee, thanks, I wasn't hoping for gold, jewels, or magic swords, but a playing card's fine, thanks. Now that you've passed your test of courage, you can head back and meet with your contact, General Caraway. I ought to summon the two minotaurs he made me fight and use them to lay waste to his whole fucking house. Test of courage, my ass. The general is actually Renoa's father, although in my version everyone's much more insulting about it. Where's a whore? You're a whore's father? Anyway, the plan is that the group will split into two teams. The sniper team will camp out in a carousel tower where there's a rifle waiting, and the second team will wait near a gatehouse and trap the sorceress's motorcade inside long enough for Irvin to take the shot. It's fairly simple, at least in comparison to the whole train switching mess. Naturally, it's such a good plan that it immediately gets screwed up in every conceivable way. Just after the sniper team leaves, Renoma wanders into the room with a new idea that she's got some kind of magical bracelet that she thinks could nullify the sorceress's powers. I'm curious to how she intends to get through presidential security and force the most dangerous witch in the world to wear a harmful bracelet, but Renoma is an idiot, so she probably hasn't thought that far ahead. It's a pretty stupid idea, so Quistus tells her to ram it. But once she gets her team into position, Quista starts feeling really bad about being rude to her. So she abandons her post to go back and apologize. Yeah, that's a thought, but how, how about this? How about we wait ten minutes until after the high-profile political assassination? Is that possible? And that's why you don't let women in the military! Am I right, people? Huh? Of course, by the time she gets back, Renoa's already gone off alone to fuck up everyone else's plan, and Quistus, the stupid tit, somehow gets locked in the house. And wouldn't you know it, the windows are whip-proof. Meanwhile, Renoa climbs the sorceress's window and decides the best course of action is to loudly announce her presence and say hello. It doesn't work. The sorceress zaps her in the brain and goes to the balcony to make a speech to the assembled crowd like nothing happened. Actually, nothing did happen. Hey, you know what might have worked? Is to load your dog onto your wrist crossbow thingy and fire it at Mach 2 into the back of her head. Yeah. Thrill at her evil powers! She can style her own hair with a mere thought and make a giant thingy sprout out of her back! Most surprising of all, she can keep her boobs inside that dress without the use of double-sided tape! And she can walk through walls and dominate the minds of pasty bimbos! I'm actually really interested in what the sorceress has to say, what her politics are, what her diplomatic platform is. Low lifes, shameless, filthy wretches. No, wrong! Open with a joke or something, you're losing them! Actually, if you listen, the crowd still seems firmly behind her. Yay! How you celebrate my ascension with such joy, hailing the very one whom you have condemned for generations. Have you no shame? What happened to the evil, ruthless sorceress from your fantasies? The cold-blooded tyrant that slaughtered countless men and destroyed many nations? She stands before your very eyes to become your new ruler! <laughs> um, sorceress, you're going way off the prompter. No one can help you. Sit back and enjoy the show. And then she rips out the president's fucking soul in front of the entire nation. And instead of panicking, they're loving it. Just listen to them. They're still cheering even when she starts threatening to destroy them as well. Rest assured, you fools, your time will come. Let us start a new reign of terror. <laughs> yeah, it's probably good that George W. Bush didn't go with this as his re-election speech. But um, seriously, what is it with so much fiction where people put clearly evil, insane megalomaniacs into positions of absolute power? Well, it happens all the time in comics. Like, my favorite is early in the Green Lanterns, where everyone is stunned. Stunned to learn that a dude named Sinestro, a purple guy with a snidely whiplash mustache, might turn out to be evil. Oh, and uh, in the Fantastic Four movie, Rise of the Silver Surfer, where the government hires Victor Von Doom to fight the Silver Surfer, even though Victor just went on a public killing spree in the middle of New York City, no less, 
and that was in the last movie. So, you know, if people are really this stupid, it's hard for me to feel sorry for them. It really is. From NBC News, this is a Decision 2008 special. NBC News calling for the Democratic candidate. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe it! Of all my master schemes to take over the world, the thousands I killed with my army of robotic suicide squirrels, the millions I spent trying to kill you all with push and eat macaroni in a tube, my even as of yet uncompleted orbital death ray, and all I had to do was run for president? <laughs> I wasn't even really taking this all that seriously. I even used my real name. You voted for a guy named Dr. Insano. I mean, I know Lex Luthor won last term, but I thought that just had something to do with Superboy Prime punching reality. I never thought this would work. My election platform was to build a giant robot saw blade that would cut Canada off at the top and then attach it to Australia so they wouldn't bother us anymore. My vice president, is Fu Manchu! What the hell is wrong with you people? I'm pretty sure that's not even legal! Oh man, we are so going to jack this country up beyond repair. Oh, no point in wasting any more time. Oh, let's see, I know I had some important things here. Oh yes, you'll soon all receive your mandatory reassignment orders to my obedience domes. Failure to comply will result in your summary execution, uh, reanimation, and then your zombified corpses will be taken to serve as cannon fodder in my gladiatorial arena, where you will periodically be chosen by lottery to fight in with various dinosaurs, robots, aliens, and other foul agents of the undead I create in my science lab. With science? Oh, let's see, I know I'm forgetting something. Um, Fu, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Amazingly, nobody seems at all disturbed by the sorcerers committing a grisly murder in public. In fact, they throw a parade complete with dancers, a band, and floats. Somehow, Quistus gets back in position in time to close the gates, trapping the motorcade and allowing time for Irvin to take the shot. I can't do it. Oh, God damn it! are you serious? Yep, the Garden entrusted a major political assassination to a rookie who's never actually killed anybody before, and now that the moment's come to take the shot, Irvin's completely lost his balls. Just explain to me why he's suddenly gone nutless now, when he was perfectly happy to shoot people in the face with a sawed-off shotgun at point-blank range not long ago. After a few minutes, they finally managed to browbeat Irvin into taking the shot anyway, but by then it's too late and the Sorceress is wise to the whole scheme. Squall just says fuck it and charges into the motorcade with gun blades swinging, but he's blocked by Cypher who's acting as the sorcerer's personal bodyguard now. But sadly for Cypher, he hits like a complete bitch. I guess the sorcerers did give him a hundred demi spells to junction to his strength attribute like I've got. I absolutely spank this guy in like two rounds. The sorcerer's is no big sweat either, especially since I just found this Pikachu looking thing that casts Reflect on everyone. Sadly, my green Tokopi's reflective powers are no match for the Sorceress's deadly ice bolts of plot convenience, and Squall is impaled through the chest. Man, they're really milking the drama here, making us think Squall is dead. I mean, we've only finished the first disc out of four. There's three more to go! There's three more to go. Yeah. <laughs> There's only three more to go. There's three more. I've done one out of four, and there's three more.
And there will be no bailout of the auto industry, I can promise you that! You see, I'm hereby replacing all of the American auto workers with robots! So you see, all organic life as you know it, including the economy, is hereby obsolete under my new scientific order! <laughs> oh wait, no, there is some organic life that will be spared. The suicide girls will hereby become part of my personal harem, but besides that, you're all screwed. <laughs> I do love those tattooed bitches. <laughs>